welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're going to be going through a revenue model for a consumer retail company. We're using CEC Entertainment, otherwise known as Chuck E. Cheese, which is basically a kid's restaurant chain in the U.S. They have video games, they have arcades, they have a lot of other things. It was acquired by Apollo in a $1.3 billion leverage buyout, and we're looking at it because it's an interesting example to learn this concept of how to build a revenue model. So I have, as always, the Excel file we're going to be using here. And I always like to start with why a certain topic is important. And in this case, building a revenue model, it's a topic that could come up in case studies and in interviews. It could come up in investment banking, private equity, hedge funds. They could give you something like this in an LBO case study. They could give you a three statement modeling case study. They could even ask you normal interview questions about it. And to show you exactly what I'm talking about here, you can see here that I've listed the company's total revenue as well as the revenue growth rates, the historical revenue growth rates underneath right before the deal took place. Now, what we could do is we could go in and say, you know what, revenue is going to grow at 5% next year, and then 4%. And based on that, we're going to take the old number, multiply by 1 plus 5%, and we get to revenue numbers like that. And you could do that. And in many case studies, that's all you're going to do. You will give, be given a percentage growth rate, or you'll make an estimate on your own, and calculate revenue like that. But a slightly better approach, actually a much better approach, is to go up and think about what drives the company. So for a retailer, it would be the number of existing stores they have, how much in sales each of them is generating on average, and then how many new stores they're opening each year, and how much in sales those stores on average are generating. So we're going to go through that and look at how you project some of those numbers and get to better grounded numbers for revenue here. And in addition to being important in case studies and interviews, also in a lot of cases, companies disclose a lot of data on the revenue side, but not that much data on the expense side. So it's often much easier to go into more detail on revenue projections than it is on expense projections, unless you happen to get lucky and they give you a lot of information or you're working with them as a client and you have access to more detailed information. Now, how do you actually set it up and what is it? Well, the two main methods are to use units sold times the average selling price or the total market size times the company's percent market share. And you'll sometimes use a combination of both of these. You'll sometimes mix the two a bit. But bottom line is that the method you use depends on, first and foremost, the available data, the work and research you've done, and then what the company actually discloses. So for consumer retail in this example, if you think about it, it would be almost impossible to use something like total market size because it's a huge and fragmented market. Think about the restaurant market, the kids' restaurant market. They're so big that it's almost impossible to establish it. Also, the company discloses a lot of information on average sales per store. So if you go in and look at their annual reports, they actually tell you how many stores have opened historically. They go through and tell you the average annual sales per store. So they make it very easy to project the numbers like that. And the goal with this type of model is to show what happens over the next three, five, 10 years under a variety of different scenarios and assumptions. So for example, what happens if they only open 10 stores instead of 15 stores? What happens if sales per store only grow by 2% rather than 3% or 4%? How does that impact revenue? And how does that impact our returns if we're looking at this as an investment? So how do you actually go about the process of building a revenue model? It depends a bit on the industry. I've listed a few examples here. If you're working with something like a software company or a subscription company, a software company that sells software on a subscription basis, like salesforce.com, for example, you look at the number of subscribers, the average annual subscription, the dollar amount for that, the growth rate, and the churn rate. So how many people come in, how many people leave each year? If you're thinking about something like airlines, you might start with available seat miles, you might calculate the segments flown, the number of flights, the average percent on each flight that's actually occupied, and then the dollars per passenger. And I have an example here for EasyJet. You can see some of the logic that basically what we're doing is looking at the available seat kilometers, and then we're looking at the average sector length. We're looking at the total number of seats that are flown. So the total number of flights times the average passenger count on each flight. And then we're figuring out the seat revenue on each of those different segments and then just sort of multiplying everything through. So that's how we get to revenue here. I'm not going to go into detail because that's not our example, but just to show you for variety. If you're looking at something like healthcare, you might look at the pipeline of drugs or their products. You might estimate the market size, the launch date, the potential revenue. And then of course for retail, we would divide it into existing stores versus new stores, assume an average sales per store or per square foot or square meter, and then make assumptions for new stores opened, stores closed, and how the sales figures change over time. So what's the overall process here? Step one, I'm going to divide this into a seven-step process. So step one is to get all the historical 
data that we actually need. So in this case, I've already done a lot of the work here and I've already filled in the information for us. You can see that going back historically, we have the total number of stores. They separate it into company owned versus franchise, but it's mostly company owned. So we're not gonna pay too much attention to that. They give the average annual sales per comparable store and then the number of stores that were actually comparable from year to year. So we have a lot of the information. And then if you keep going forward in the filings, you can find all the information about the number of stores that were new, the number of stores that were closed each year, and so on and so forth. So what I've done here to save us some time is I've already filled in a lot of this information and just go up here and zoom out so you can see this a bit better. So I already have all the new stores open, stores closed, the growth and sales per store, and so on and so forth. I also have all the stats on the sales per store down here. So that's step one. And then step two, we have to make assumptions for the number of stores that were opened and closed each year. So in a lot of cases, companies will actually tell you this in their filings, or you can extrapolate based on historical trends. You could also do your own channel checks. You could speak with suppliers, customers, partners in the market, could look in equity research. So there are a lot of ways that you can come up with estimates for this. But what I'm going to do here is actually show you how the company points this out directly in their filings. So let me just set up a frame here so you can see this better. And then if you go to their filings, the filing from the year before this deal took place, look at this. They say here on page 39 that the growth plan over the next four years is to open approximately 50 to 60 new stores. So they're giving you the number right there. And you just have to make sure that you assume something in that range for your numbers to match up. And then 12 to 15, they plan to open in 2013, which was just before the deal took place at a cost of approximately 2.7 million per store. So they're giving you all their plans and stats up front. And so what we can do then based on that is go in and actually start filling in these numbers. So we're going to say 15 in 2014, because remember they said 12 to 15, they may increase this over time because the company lately has been doing better. They've been on an uptick, whereas in the past few years before this, sales were falling and sales per store were also falling. So we're gonna see 15, 16, 16, 17, and 17. And if you just do a quick check of these numbers, so let's just add these up over four years. This comes to exactly 60 stores open. So it's in line with their estimates, although it is at the high end. Now. One thing they didn't disclose is the number of stores they're planning to close. That's the other side of this. Not every store is going to perform well. And if you look back at this historically, they've closed between two and six stores each year. So we're going to assume something in that range about the same as what they've closed in the past two years. So I'm going to say negative five, negative six, negative six, negative seven, negative seven. And by negative, of course, we're really just doing that so that later on we can just add this up and have it be reflected in the total store count. Now for the growth in sales per comparable store and growth in sales per new store. So this one is a little murkier because the numbers are all over the place here. The safest thing to do in this scenario, growth in sales per comparable store, this rarely changes by a huge amount. So we're just going to sort of assume flat growth here. They had 1.3% right before the deal took place. We're going to say 1% going forward each year to be conservative. And because we really don't have any other insights into the data, the numbers jump around a lot historically. The growth in sales per new store, again, we're gonna mostly follow the sales per comparable store here because we have less faith in these numbers. New stores tend to be a lot more volatile, but for modeling purposes, we like to use some more consistent numbers. So I'll say 0.5%, 0.5%, 0.5%, 0.5%, 0.5% and 0.5% each year. And so we have our basic assumptions here. Of course, we're gonna tweak and modify these later on. So we're done with that step of the process. That was step two. And then actually step three, we've already assumed the growth rate and sales per comparable store. So we're done with that. Step four, we're going to calculate the ending stores per year. So in other words, they add a certain number of stores and then they close down a certain number of stores. What does it look like at the end of that process? And then after that, we're going to make similar calculations for the sales per new store and sales per existing store. So let's go up and take a look at this. And what I'm going to do here is once again, set up a frame. So for the beginning stores each year, we're going to just link this to the ending store number from the year before. And then for the number of new and acquired stores. So for this one, we're going to take the number up here that we're assuming, and then I'm going to multiply by something called the sensitivity toggle. Now to show you how to do this, I need to remove the frame. But the idea here is that we want to be able to tweak these assumptions and we want to be able to toggle this and make it go up or down by a certain percentage. So I'm going to take this number and multiply by one plus the toggle right here. And we have that. And then for the number of closed stores, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're just going to take the number up here and then multiply by one plus the num store toggle, as I call it. That 
let's add these up and then let's calculate the growth rate in stores as well. And then what we can do is just copy this over and we can see that at the end of the period they own 572 stores after five years, whereas three or four years before that they owned about 500, 507 stores, expanded by about 30. So it seems reasonable that they could expand by around 40 stores total net over these next five years. Now, for these other numbers, similar approach. For the growth rates and sales per comparable store, we're just going to take our numbers up here and then multiply by 1 plus our toggle, sales per store toggle. And then do the same thing here. So we'll take the number up there and then multiply by that toggle as well. And then we'll copy this over. And then what we can do is just take the old number, multiply by 1 plus the growth rate, and then do the same thing down here, and then we can just copy these across. So we have that. And so we're almost done. The problem though is that we need to split this into segments, and we need to split both the revenue itself into segments, and then also the stores into different segments. So how do we do that? Well, let's go up here. And the first problem is that although we know the total number of stores each year, it's not as simple as just saying the ending stores minus anything we added this year, those are the comparable stores because you don't know. They could be renovating them, they could be changing them around other ways. So a better approach is to look at this as a percentage of the total ending stores. So I've taken the comparable store figures that they have in their filings and I've done that. And what I can do here is just take a simple average of all these over the past four years and then we can carry this forward like that. And then what we can do is just multiply this percentage by the ending stores each year. And that gives us the comparable store count each year. How is this useful? Well, now what we can do is calculate total sales by comparable stores and new stores. So to do this, let's take our comparable store dollar amount here and multiply by the number of comparable stores. And we'll divide by units so we can convert that properly. And then for new stores, so what we're going to do, remember, comparable stores is based on the ending stores up at the very top of this. So what we can do here is just take our total ending stores, subtract the comparable stores, and then multiply by the sales per new store and divide by units again to convert it. Add these up, and then we can copy this over. So we have that. And then really the final step here is to divide this revenue itself, all the store revenue into segments. And specifically, they sell food and beverages, and then they also have entertainment and merchandise, the video games and the arcades and the other high-end gadgets and toys that I was talking about before. So this is important because the margins on these will be very different. If you take a quick look below, you can see that clearly the margins on entertainment and merchandise Expenses there, COGS are around 30, 40 million a year on revenue of around 400, over 400 million. The margins are going to be much higher on those than they will be on the food and beverage segment. So that's why it's important to split this up in this case. Now here, they have a clear trend going in one direction, that they're moving away from food and beverages and moving into these higher margin items. So we're going to continue that trend and say 45%, 44.5%, 44%, 43.5%, and 43%. And again, it's just based on the fact that historically it's fallen by around 4%. So it makes sense that in the future, to be conservative, it maybe falls by 2% percent of revenue from that over the next five years. And then to finish this off, we can just take one and subtract that number. And then what we can do really is the final step in this model is we, now we can link in the food and beverage sales and the entertainment and merchandise sales. Let's take our total store sales and multiply by those percentages. Have that. And then franchising fees and royalties. This is so small, we're not gonna worry about it too much, but to get this, you can just take an average and then you can just link to these numbers, the average number historically and add these up and then calculate the revenue growth rates like this. So we have that. And that's it. That's really all we have to do to get our revenue model in place. So as you can see, not terribly complicated, but the way we set it up here is very specific because look at this. Now, let's say if I wanted to go in and let's say I wanted to say, you know what, let's say that we have 5% more stores per year that are open. What happens as a result? Well, you go down, you can see that revenue is growing now more like 3% per year. We end up with 950 million at the end versus before we had only 944 million. So it makes a difference, but not as much of a difference as you might think. Now, if the stores per year went up by 20%, then we have more of a difference. Now we have 960 million in revenue growing by over 3% per year. And so that's really the point of building in these types of toggles. And if you kept going at the model, you could look at operating expenses, capital expenditures, you could go and fill in a whole lot of other things. But 
this is just the baseline. This is just the starting point for you. And of course, after this, that's what you would do. You'd, you would go through and fill in the expenses. You go to the other financial statements and start filling in your projections for those. So just to recap what we did here, revenue models are important because you want to ground your numbers in reality rather than just assuming a simple percentage growth rate if you can do so and if you have the time to do so. Now, to do it, you usually look at units sold times average selling price or market size times percent market share. The best method really depends on the industry, the company, and what they disclose. How do you build it? Well, I have a few examples here, which I went through before, but usually you start with the historical data, then you make assumptions for the key drivers. So in this case, the number of stores opened and closed and how the sales per store changes. Those are really the key drivers for a retail company like this. You assume a growth rate for those and you calculate the ending stores each year. You make sure that you build in sensitivity toggles so you can easily modify the assumptions. Then you make similar assumptions for sales per new store and sales per existing store. You split the revenue into those segments and then you split it further into food and beverages and entertainment and merchandise. And then for the final step, you could go back and check your numbers. We did that a little bit already. You could go in and look at equity research and see how your numbers there compare. So you can go and do that on your own if you want, see what other people are saying about this company at this point in time. I'm not gonna cover it here, but that would be the next step in this process. And then of course you can go back and tweak your numbers as necessary. So what next? Go and try this yourself. Go and pick a company you're interested in, an industry that's relatively easy to analyze in terms of key drivers and project revenue based on what's in their filings and what they disclose. It doesn't have to be super complicated. Most companies honestly are driven by fewer than five key factors, at least if they're only in one or two business segments. You should avoid conglomerates. So something like General Electric, for example, or Samsung would be a bad example because they do so many different things that it's tougher to project there. Avoid companies with a lot of business lines or industries that are more complex like oil and gas, commercial banking, and so on. A few suggestions for you to try would be airlines, technology companies, consumer retail companies, industrial or manufacturing companies. Healthcare is a little bit iffy. If it's a very simple company with only one or two or a few products, you can do it. If it is Pfizer or a company with thousands of product lines and different drugs in development, you probably want to avoid it. So those are a few suggestions, but Go ahead, get started with this yourself and use it for practice in case studies, interviews, modeling tests, and whatever else may come up along the way.